DC voters, I'm Lisa Rice, native Washingtonian, proposer of Ballot Initiative 83. Let's make politicians work harder with two changes to our system. One, let independents like me vote in taxpayer-funded primary elections. And two, implement ranked choice voting to vote for your favorite candidate and rank your backup choices. Candidates need over 50% to win. Flip your ballot and vote yes on 83. Paid for by Make All Votes County C, Philip Pinnell, Treasurer. Today on CityCast DC, it's our Friday News Roundup. But this week, Bridget and I are doing it live in front of a CityCast audience at the Black Cat. That's right, Mike. Reporter Tom Sherwood is here with us to discuss the Trayon White case, which is now looking like it might not go to trial until a month after the election. We're also going to get into the referendum over ranked choice voting in D.C. and what our city could be in for as a result of the national elections. Today is Friday, October 11th. I'm Bridget Todd. I'm Michael Schaefer. And here's what D.C. is talking about. Thanks, y'all. Hey, everyone. I'm Bridget. I'm Mike. I'm Tom. We are so excited. First of all, give it up for yourselves for being here. Thank you for coming. So we were all having a few drinks backstage and sort of chatting. And one question that came up. No, one drink. One drink. Well, some of us have one. for yourself, sure. Yeah. If you were giving a bribe... Where would you want to do it? I said sauna, and then you said, oh, well, then where are you putting the money? Because I'm thinking in a sauna, there's no camera, but... But money gets... I mean, unless I was bribing you in bullion. (laughs) Pure gold. Um, You know, look at what... When when, uh, Councilmember Trayon White allegedly took this bribe, uh, he was in a car, which is a place where apparently there's a lot of places to secret a video camera. Um, and, uh, if I was taking a bribe, I think I would do it like in a big open field, far from trees or hidden cameras. Yeah. Something about being like secretly videotaped in a car just suggests guilt to me. Like nobody looks good when they're secretly being filmed in a car. No. Good. Well, if you're going to be bribed, use your own car. (laughs) Smart. (laughs) You know, the guy who, how many times do we have to say allegedly tonight? (laughs) Have like a big, bleeding, allegedly According to the prosecutors. There you go. The guy, they, they wired his car up. It, it was unbelievable with the cameras. No one would have a record they had cameras like that in their car. Um, I, I would just do it in my own car because I know where everything is in my car. Well, you cover the council. Does Trayon White have a car? Yes, several cars. <laughs> exactly. He drives a Tesla that has a D.C. council member tag. Ooh, la, la. There are two other cars in his home in Ward 8, his legal home, where he, <laughs> not, not the apartment. Does anyone here live at 10K Southeast? <laughs> I'm sick to death of standing outside that um, apartment building. I did get one guy who was walking his dogs. I complimented the dogs, and he went up to the penthouse to see if the FBI had smashed the door <laughs> in because I had videotape someone gave me of the FBI people going into the, to raid the apartment where Trayon had parties. And unfortunately, they, he didn't bust the door in. I thought it would be a great picture. Now, Tom is one of the legendary journalists in Washington, D.C. history, and he has just given us a secret uh, trick of the trade, compliment the dogs of passersby. <laughs> And, and I have to, just to be truthful, since we're not being recorded here, um, <laughs> there were two of those little ratty-ass dogs. <laughs> the ones that always look sick? Which I actually hate. But I complimented them anyway, because I had a larger reason. <laughs> not that the media is devious. I mean, technically, I feel like all three of us are the media. We are the media. Enormously. And we're here to help you. So there is an election in, in just a few weeks, as you may have heard. It's ongoing now. You, you may have even gotten your ballots. Uh, and there is a local D.C. election, which is getting somewhat less attention. Um, 
But the notion that one of the candidates for one of the council seats could be expelled, um, and then if he is uh, elected by the voters, he would be reseated and then re-expelled, depending on how things go, um, is a fairly wild set of eventualities. What's going to happen? What are the various, like, touch points in the next few weeks? I think we're all assuming, those of you in the audience here, no, we're talking about Trayon White, the Ward 8 council member who was arrested for bribery in August, and he's up for re-election on November the 5th. And there are some people who had hoped that he would drop out of the race, that there could be a write-in campaign, but he's not dropping out. And he's most likely, there's only one other person on the ballot, an unknown a Republican candidate who I can't see doing very much in Ward 8. But the council, the 13 member, 12 members of the council, voted to spend $400,000 on a law firm to investigate what the prosecutors have already investigated. But that's the, cri the criminal trial is what the prosecutors have done. <clears throat> the council needs administratively to decide that Trayon White violated the law and violated council rules. And they could either reprimand him, censor him, or expel him. The expectation is this investigation by the law firm will be released in December, and the council will expel him from the current seat that he's in. And if he wins our election on November 5th, he's entitled to take office again on January the 2nd, in which case there would have to be a second expelling of him. And then there would be a special election to replace him for that board, I think. And he, if he's not convicted, could run for it and get reelected. And if the council, it's, an, it's like a hall of mirrors here, but uh, <laughs> that's what's happening. But the, the true expectation is that the prosecutors have enough to convict him. That's their point of view. And the expectation is he might plead guilty to a lesser crime and resign, but we're months away from that happening. And is, that's a pretty typical thing, right? They, they yeah. use the resignation as a sort of a, a part of the ultimate it's a, deal. It's a, bargaining, it's a bargaining chip. The public integrity section of the Justice Department has one goal. That's to get corrupt people out of office. How they do it, what they charge them with, what they agree to do. They first want the person out of office. If he just simply resigns, well, they'll go ahead and prosecute him. So he's holding back for two reasons. One, you have a bargaining chip. And two, he thinks, being the Ward 8 council member, that he's somewhat like the former mayor, Marion Barry, mm. who faced legal issues and just resisted every legal case that came against him, every investigation, every complaint. And I think Trayon wants to fight it out. Well, but as he may, as he may recall, Barry's resistance was not, he didn't have a 100% record of beating the charges. <laughs> Well, he, there were lots of investigations of Barry, which went nowhere. I mean, he had a good batting average. I'm just saying it wasn't perfect. There was, there, there was a well, jail sentence. One little minor misdemeanor. That's all. I do want to ask because I, I feel like... I can't see the audience. <laughs> Tom, they're loving you. I can tell. All smiles. Oh, good. This, this is better. Reassure Tom that y'all are there and feeling it. <laughs> see, Tom? They're loving it. Well, I do have a question because everyone I know who lives in his ward is like, he's not going anywhere. He has tons of supporters. And they all tell me that, like, he is the guy when you have a pothole on your block, you can text his personal number and he will take care of it. Like, he really... Wait, somebody, somebody... No. I want to hear... It said there's no. T tell us what you have to say. Hey, senior producer Julia here. We weren't able to catch this on mic, but one of the attendees, Eric, who lives in Ward 8, said that while council member Trayon White has a reputation for helping coordinate neighborhood fixes, some as small as potholes, he doesn't actually follow through as much as his reputation would suggest. Eric says he doesn't think White is purposely misleading, but that there is a disconnect between what he appears to do and what actually gets done. Thanks for the insight, Eric. Okay, now back to the show. The audience person is saying that Trayon White didn't attend a constituent service and actually real help for the people of Ward 8, which mo you should know most of it's in southeast Washington, but a significant new portion of it is over by the baseball ballpark. But what, and that is, I, I, I understand some of the complaints about constituent service. I hear that about a lot of the council members, but it, Trayon White made his reputation by showing up at shootings and different kinds of events like that, 
expressing concern for the people who had been shot, families had been left behind. And so that's where he got a lot of his popularity, as I understand it. But I wonder, is it like from, I think what Eric is saying is like, is it an optics thing where you do it a couple of times and then you get that reputation and then you can sort of coast on that while doing actually not a lot of meaningful stuff in the community? That's, that's, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems like Eric is suggesting that maybe that's an intentional optics thing. I, I, well, I, that, I do think the, there is a the history of Trey on White being active in Ward 8. Whether he's effectively active or not, I think would be a, a different show. But that's the thing in like, you know, how you think about a city council, right? That like, right. there is this model, he didn't invent it. Yeah. Harry Thomas uh, Sr. Uh, was famous for this, right? He, was, he would hand out, you know, 10 bucks to kids who got good grades and, and get, you'd call him with, you know, the street lights out, can you get someone to fix it? And he wouldn't sponsor a whole lot of legislation or conduct oversight or any of the things that are actually job, actually the job. And there's a, you know, I think voters have the right to say like, well, wait a minute, what should, I'm supposed to feel grateful to you for getting the government to do something it's supposed to do already, mm. like fix my butthole, when in fact, what you're supposed to be doing is sponsoring legislation, conducting oversight, et cetera, et cetera, the official job duties of a lawmaker. Well, but well, I think in real life, people do respond really positively to someone showing up. They do respond to turkey giveaways. They, they do. They do respond to free tickets to the Nats games. They do respond to things like that because the, just like, CityCast and other podcasts that want to have an emotional connection with people, you can have an emotional connection with them rather than having a two-hour debate over the quality of your school. Not that you're not interested in the latter, but people pay attention. I always ask, do you want me to talk about scandals in the city or do you want to talk about the D.C. $20 billion budget? And then before they answer, I say, well, the $20 billion budget has five parts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't criticize Trey on White for being a kind of a typical, and I don't mean for the district, I mean for everywhere, a council member or a state delegate or whatever. Is there any other election in the November, the general election, that seems interesting, exciting, telling? You know, that the but there's no, one, not... no, no other candidate has been charged with the bribery. Or... <laughs> no, actually, this is a pretty weak, mild election. There are two at-large members, Christina Henderson and Robert White writing for re-election at large, they're both going to win. Robert White is running for mayor. He ran last time for mayor, and he's going to run again in 2026. He says he's thinking about it, but I'm telling you, he's going to run for mayor. But Janice Lewis George in Ward 4, which is part of Upper Northwest Washington, she's unopposed in the gym now. Brooke Bento, who represents, I believe, this neighborhood, Ward 2, since Ward 2. All day long. Thank you. Just, I thought so, but I wanted to see if the audience was with me. Uh, but Brooke Pinto is running for re-election. She's on the post. And uh, Vince Gray, who is the former council member, challenge chairman, mayor, and council member, has been ill, and he's not running. And there's a new guy, Wendell Fulton Ford. I always Ford. forget his name. He's going to win. So we don't have a lot of contested cases. So we can all go home. <laughs> I do have a question. Where do you think Bowser goes from here? Well, Bowser is just into her third term, second year of her third term. There's expectation that she will run for re-election again. Her, one of her major goals, besides all the good government things she, she talks about, but one of them is she wants to bring the Washington football team back to a site at RFK. Um, I think if she were to get the football team here in ways that were not seen as a holdup of the city, then I think she could easily win re-election for her fourth term. But there are some people who have already said to me, well, you know, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's on the ballot this year again for, I think, her 18th term in office as con Congress, and she went up to Congress when she was about 53. She probably, she'll win this in November, but she likely won't run again in two years, and that maybe Mayor Bowser would run for the congressional seat. <music>
That's why talking to a professional who can help is so important. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp makes it easier than ever to take this first step. It's all online. You just fill out a quick questionnaire to be matched with a licensed therapist, and then you design your own plan based around your schedule. And if you ever want to change your therapist at any time, you can, for no extra charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CityCast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash CityCast. But so the other thing on the ballot, since uh, there's not that many hot elections, is Initiative 83. Mm. Um, That's a topic I have to tell you. Wait, let's do a little experiment. Who is pro, you can just like cheer, clap. Who is pro Initiative 83? Who is anti? Okay, well. (laughs) Well, that settles. Next (laughs) next topic. (laughs) Yeah, explain what it is. Well, ranked choice, who's read it? You want me to read it to you? I can know of. There there are two parts to it. It's a citizen initiative to change the way people are elected to council and mayor seats here in the District of Columbia. One would be right choice voting. That's where where you, we now have, if you get more votes than anyone else, you win. If 25 people are running for the at-large seat on the council and you get 12% of the vote and no one else gets that much, you're the new council member. So right choice voting would allow voters to rank their maybe top three or could be as many as five, but that's to be decided, say the top three, and then if someone didn't get 50% of the votes, in that contest, the person with the lowest number of votes would drop off, and that person's votes would be apportioned to whoever their second choice was until you get to someone with 50%. That's the most simple way to explain it. There are some quirks to it that you could raise, but that's what it does. The other aspect of the Initiative 83 would allow non-aligned, independent people, people who are not Democrats, not Republicans, not statehood, green members who are not a member of a party, but are registered as essentially independents, of which there are about 80,000 voters. And under this initiative, if it were to pass and implemented by the city, independent voters with no party identification could choose to vote in any primary. You couldn't vote in all of them, but you could choose to vote in the Democratic primary. You could choose to vote in the Republican primary you could choose to vote in the statehood primary. And the whole point of the two is to get more people, more voters, more people interested in the elections. Was that clear enough? Is that pretty simple? Brilliant. I know there's some I-83 people in there. I don't want them to rush the state. Uh Who's against Initiative 83 is the parties themselves. They think this is a bad idea, Uh, presumably because it it, uh, lessens the power of like party machinery to put the thumb on the scale for one candidate or another. Right. If um, you're a Democrat, then you have to go out and chase down parts of 80,000 independent people who you're not even active with. I mean, is there like a, is there a non-self-interested case against this that, has, that somebody has articulated? Well, yes. One general thing is that it actually can be quite complicated to voters, even in the District of Columbia, where we every two years we elect two at-large council members and I was talking to an election official today, and they said very often people might know one person and they vote for one person, but they don't either know to vote for the second person or they don't know the second person, and so they don't vote, and so there's a drop-off. And so you've got to educate the voter that when she goes into the voting booth or she mails in her ballot, she has to vote for three people, even though it might be one office. And it's, it's just it's not as readily understandable as you think across the board of all the voters. You have senior citizens who've always voted one way, and it's going to take some education, which brings up another possible news item. Is this likely going to pass? Generally speaking, initiatives pass. The council, most of the members have said that they won't vote to overturn it. But what they haven't said is how they're going to fund it and how they're going to implement it. It means the Board of Elections will need more money 
But here's the deal. It's supposed to go into effect in 2026, which is our next mayor's race, next chairman's race, next attorney general race, and council member races. There's some feeling, not publicly articulated very well yet, that that's too many elections to have a brand new voting system. Why don't we wait and do it in 2028 when we're only having four or five council members on the ballot? and just try it out the first time. Arlington, Virginia had bright choice voting. First time they did it, it was chaotic the way they were trying to count the votes and apportion the votes, portions of votes to people, and they changed it. Now they're doing it differently. So it's possible that we could all vote for it on November the 5th, all the folks who cheered, but it may not go into effect until at least 20, it won't go into effect at least 26, and I'm thinking it may not go into effect until 2028. There's not that many this year, but there is this tradition in D.C. of these elections where there's like 15 people running for at large and they all get like 9% of the vote. The math doesn't work there, but you get the idea. Uh, um, I think people would have an easier time. And this is my my every election season plea to our elected officials and aspiring elected officials. Please, people, get new graphic designers. Oh, my God. These signs. Don't even get me started. They have these signs all around town that'll have like your name, like Sherwood, Todd, and that's it. It doesn't say what you stand for. Sometimes there's your picture, like, oh, okay, you know, he's a handsome raising guy. Raising general um, awareness right. for Todd. Like he exists. And then, and I guess you're supposed to think like, well, so many people, like my neighbors, so many like street posts have this person's name on them. That you're he must you're be not legit. the market. I know, but like, couldn't they somehow, like, this is where a good graphic designer comes in, because I'm not, I can't do it, but like, wedge in like what you stand for, you know, like no. stop the bike lanes or start the bike lanes, I, either I, way. I, I, I assure you, people are not riding along reading campaign signs. The only part of a campaign sign is to replicate your name so it's recognizable when they hear it or see it somewhere else. It's not for a 10-point plan to fix the Anacostia River. But it's like a one-point plan for what you stand no, for. We, <laughs> no, you know, it, it's just not done that way. You want the, you want your name, and that's that's the way it works. It's not bumper sticker campaigning. So we don't even have bumper stickers anymore. So, cool. When's the last time you saw one that wasn't whack job? Oh, I love when you're driving and you see you're behind somebody who has just a whole bunch of bumper stickers on the back of their car. You we do need. Of, we, you see a lot of magnets, need, and those those seem like a sign of low grade. I mean, like, you don't have the guts to stick it to your car. You how, commit. how much can you really support this person? <laughs> so wishy-washy. We do need to make our elections. You know, there's a law that when we have elections now, on the fair elections program where you get money to help your campaign, you have to participate in, I think, at least one debate. It, but that's still not good enough. There ought to be a way to get more social media so people can see it and social media that everyone has access to. But, you know, elections are face-to-face. and it's, They call it retail politics for a reason. It's not an academic exercise. The candidates who try to engage in academic exercises fail. For any exp- aspiring folks running for office, I feel like that's some good free advice. Looks like I'm not going to be in Tom's top three choices on that ranked no. choice ballot. <laughs> and if Tom were to run for office, his sign would just say, Tom. And then, like, let you figure it no, out. It, it, it would say, sure would, sure will. Oh. <laughs> tell, me, tell me you can. Did you have that in the chamber, or did you come up with that? I didn't just think of it. Okay. Should we talk about Trump and national election stuff? Should we? Absolutely, because we're we're in deep doo doo if he wins. Okay, tell us more. How? What? No, you ask the question. Okay. Well, my first question is sort of that. Like, how are you feeling about it? Are you worried? Are you prepping? What's going on? I wrote a column a few weeks ago about like what happens to abortion rights in D.C. if there's a Republican trifecta, and it was very interesting because you know Trump has now said, "Well, I'm going to leave it up to the states," but. As uh, Republicans on the Hill like to note, this ain't no state. Um, and uh, I was, you know, I was surprised. This was this was happening right when Trump was kind of running away from his from his anti-abortion positions. And so I wrote his campaign and said, you know, what, what about the District of Columbia? And they wrote back quite quickly and said, we think it should be up to the residents of the states and the District of Columbia, which was an amazing. That's partisan. 
That's uh, part of their BS for this. But then my my uh, my editor, who is a, a, a an actual lawyer, said, "Well, yes, they said it should be up to the local governments of the states and the District of Columbia, but uh, in." Conservative orthodoxy, the local government of the District of Columbia is, in fact, the Congress. Uh, well, it's, so not the just Constitu orthodox. it's not just orthodoxy. It's in the United States Constitution. Well, there's that. Well, <laughs> that old that thing. Old thing. <laughs> it's, it's a real issue. Trump hates Muriel Bowser. He doesn't like Black Lives Matter on 16th Street. There's some suggestion that that is part of the national highway system and that that sign is technically illegal on federal rules. Uh, that's not the reason he would get rid of it. But he has said, you know, there's a provision, for those who may not know, we've only had what we call home rule government since 1973. Congress passed legislation to have an elected mayor and council. And so we have that. But in that home rule legislation, near the very end of it, and this came into effect during the Black Lives Matter protests and violence, it says that the President of the United States can take over the District of Columbia Police Department for at least 48 hours with the stroke of a pen, and that if you want, he or she wants to keep it longer than that, Congress must approve it. But, so we have a very tentative home rule here. There are some Republicans in the Congress who would like to get rid of our home rule government completely, go back to the three commissioner form of appointed government, government there are some who want a new control board to come in and control the city. And my great fear for this election is that if Trump wins and the Republicans keep control of the House and win control of the Senate, there will be no backstop for some of the crazy stuff they would like to do. Cheery stuff, folks. So, so the, the objection some people would raise to that, not me, but some people would raise to that, is that in reality... People on the Hill where, like, let's face it, the stars are typically not assigned to the committees that are overseeing D.C. That's not like a place to, you know, launch your presidential bid. Um, that these guys on the Hill just want, at the end of the day, just want to posture. They don't actually want to think about, like, removing garbage or other, like, boring aspects of municipal government. That's the uh, counter argument. Um, I, you know, I think, look, these guys have articulated a maximalist theory of how much power they have and they want to use it. And I don't think there's any reason to disbelieve that. But what do you make of that argument? Well, that's the irrational point of view that they're so busy on Capitol Hill with their national politics and their state politics that they're not going to worry about little old D.C., 68 square miles and 700,000 people. But there are members who put in legislation to get rid of our traffic cameras. That's right. There are people, who legis legislators, who want 100% a ban on abortion in the district. There are uh, all kinds of things to get introduced on a regular basis. I think the last Congress, there was 15 or 16 of them. There's the Hyde Amendment that, you know, we can't spend local, our local tax dollars or federal ta tax dollars that we get on abortion. Point being, as a citizen of the city, I was here in the Navy in 1968, and I've lived here full time since 74. I think we are in the most dire moment of what could happen if the Republicans, again, seize control of the federal government. And now that we have even mentioned that the fact that they want to disperse federal workers and get rid of the Department of Education, which could hurt the city's tax base with all these federal workers here who support our restaurants and homes and everything else, it could be really horrible. So listen, you cover the city government. How much are, time are they spending thinking about this? How do they have like a sort of a strategy? What would they do? You know, on January 21st, if this stuff comes down, this is kind of their job. Well, um, yes, what the, are they yes. Doing? Well, the mayor and the council chairman, Phil Mendelson, and other council members are, are, are acutely aware of what could happen. Yes, but their problem is Constitution gives the Congress, quote, full legislative authority, unquote, over the District of Columbia. So if it wants to do something, we can't go to the Supreme Court. Those guys, I mean, ask them for something. Um, they're not going to, we have no constitutional right except those given by Congress. And so if we just, what does the mayor say? She's looking to see who her allies are in the Republican Party. She thinks some of the Republicans in the Congress who want the football team down the street so they can go to the games when they're here in town on the weekends. There, there are lots of personal interactions and people who are there 
but we will have no authority. I get the sense they don't really want to even raise the, the scary hypotheticals to motivate no, people because well, it, might give, well, yeah. it might give people ideas. I, I'm sure I would be criticized for bringing it up now, and I've said it on the Kojo Nomni Politics Hour on Fridays at noon, if you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Got that ad in. He, he advertised his card. Um, <laughs> but so they'd say, well, don't talk about it, Tom, because, you know, I said, look, these guys, if they got control, they see us as a petri dish where they can do all their bring back the American way of life and try new things and cut this ridiculous budget we have. It's quite scary. I don't know if you all live in the district or if you live in the nearby suburbs. <laughs> You can't vote against this. I mean, you can, there's no way you can do it. It's just, I'm very anxious on November 5th. I'll be watching to see what happens. But there's like in Project 2025, in that long document, there is a, a statement asserting that the, the executive branch has control over schools in, I forget what the term is, like yeah. federal areas. So meaning like Indian reservations and the District of Columbia. And that they can right. unilaterally ban DEI programs, which is what they were uh, right. saying they want to do. We could put Trump's Bible in the classroom. God. A Bible Good. actually printed. I don't know if you saw this. It's got this Bible that they want to put in. The, was it Oklahoma schools or somewhere? Printed in China. Of course. So fitting. So fitting. Great place to end it. Give it up for Tom. <laughs> this has been so fun. Y'all, thank you so much for listening to the podcast, caring about your city, and coming out tonight. I forgot to say, Trayon White's next court day is November 13th. <laughs> You'll be reelected, and we'll see what happens. We'll do a follow-up episode. We'll, we'll get into all of it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for coming. Thanks to the staff of the Black Cat. Thanks to everybody who makes CityCast DC happen. And again, thanks to all of you. Yeah. And that's all for today here on CityCast DC. Our production team this week was Priyanka Tilvey, Julia Karen, Ash Durbin, Lizzie Goldsmith, and Elizabeth Kama. Newsletter editors Kayla Koti Stemmerman and Natalia Aldana wrote our fabulous newsletter, Hey DC, this week. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer, from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, text your friend who hasn't yet voted. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye.